Our public lecture series is an important part of the university's engagement with communities, and we host lectures that are meaningful, relevant, and above all, interesting to all who attend. Tonight's lecture is the third in this academic year series, and it's my pleasure to welcome you as we look to navigate the strange new world in which we all find ourselves. This evening, we're fortunate to be joined by Dr. Nicola Harding, who is a lecturer in criminology here at Lancaster University, Tony Sales and Adam Boom from We Fight Fraud, and Jodie Beck from Our Empty Chair. During the lecture, Dr. Harding will focus on two case studies, namely We Fight Fraud and Our Empty Chair, and their representatives will talk with us about how swift and innovative action was applied to two very different issues posed by the COVID-19 pandemic. All it re requires me to do then is to say that I wish you all a very enjoyable evening, and I'm pleased now to hand over to Dr. Nicola Harding. Nicola. Thank you very much, um, Professor Sue Black. Um, I'm really delighted that you asked us to um, talk about crime in the new world tonight. Um, and I just want to say a really quick thank you to my um, research partners and co-collaborators in this, which is Tony Sales, Adam Boom and Jody Beck. Um, this is a co-collaborated um, kind of piece of research that we've um, that we're bringing the case studies together with you tonight, which is why they're here to to speak on behalf of their organisations and talk about what they have done. So firstly, what I wanted to try and discuss is um, thinking about the COVID-19 pandemic as a distinct criminal opportunity. In early 2020, it became apparent that we were entering uncertain times as we faced the, the outbreak of a global pandemic. This began a period of intense, rapid social change. Um, and whilst many adapted to the first lockdown with the novelty of working from home, baking banana bread and joining Britain's newest PE teacher, Joe Wicks, for their morning exercise routines in their living rooms, others experienced lockdown in a very different way. And it's that that I want to talk to you about tonight. So for organised criminals, COVID-19 became a distinct criminal opportunity. And I'll talk to you a little bit about what that means um, throughout this lecture tonight. For those in prison, it meant up to 23 hours in lockdown and um, locked in the same cell with no visits from family and an inability to socially distance from staff. So when we think about us being in lockdown and those in prison and being in lockdown, it's very different experiences. Currently, there have, to, to date this morning, there have been 78,636 deaths due to COVID. This is approximately the same number of those currently imprisoned across the prison estate in England and Wales. This number will rise before this crisis is over, not only the deaths of those due to COVID-19, but also the number of people who will be incarcerated in England and Wales. The physical, social, cultural and economic harm this pandemic has brought will take years to unravel and understand. This lecture will detail two different case studies that demonstrate the way in which those with lived experience of crime, deviance and systems of social control were quick to adapt to the social changes brought about by the pandemic. Not only did those with lived experience adapt to the dramatic social change quickly, but they showed innovation in responding to the criminal opportunity of COVID-19. And it's through the two case studies that we'll look at tonight will really bring alive what I mean um, by this innovation and adaptation. But firstly, I want to consider what I mean by lived experience. So what's so important about lived experience? If you work or you research within the criminal justice system, you'll see that lived experience gets banded around quite a lot. Don't we all have lived experience of some kind because we live? Um, in qualitative phenomenological research, lived experience refers to a representation of the experiences and choices of a given person and the knowledge that they gain from these experiences and choices. When we talk about lived experience of crime, deviance and social control, we talk about people who've lived their lives experiencing um, criminal behaviour, they've engaged in deviant activities or they've been subject to the sharp end of the way in which we um, apply social controls through the criminal justice system. 
this can be more broadly, this can be someone who's experienced prison themselves, and it can be more broadly in terms of the family and friends that are directly impacted by the imprisonment um, of, of prisoners, um, such as the children, partners, um, parents, and siblings of those in prison. The focus of this research then was to identify the ways in which those with lived experience of crime, deviance and social control were able to adapt to the current crisis and identify areas within the criminal justice and security sector where innovation was being shown by lived experience actors. The research study itself, I interviewed 18 people with lived experience of crime, deviance and social control within the first two months of the pandemic begin of the of lockdown beginning so in the early couple of months of the pandemic they all identified themselves as working within the criminal justice or security sector i also performed ethnographic research where i looked online looked at um, online events that were being made available in the first few months of the locked of the first lockdown social media accounts and blog posts that were organized or written by lived experience actors in these areas from these interviews and digital ethnography, I entered, identified two case studies to examine in closer detail. And this included doing interviews with others within their organisations, further ethnography and the co-production of academic writing. So I want to kind of talk to you a little bit about why innovation and adaptation became the focus of this study. In the days leading up to and in the early weeks of lockdown, I had conversations with Tony Sales, who you'll meet shortly from We Fight Fraud, and Jodie Beck from Our Empty Chair, and others with lived experience of different kinds, such as Michaela Booth, who works for Care UK, Paula Harriet from the Prison Reform Trust. And we had these discussions about what lockdown and COVID-19 might mean for security, victimisation, criminal justice, those in prison and the families of those in prison. We noted almost with frustration that very little seemed to be happening in both areas within criminal justice and within security to identify what we saw as foreseeable problems, understanding how those problems would impact society and the interventions that weren't being considered to mitigate these problems. We felt like there wasn't really time to waste and that these issues had to be dealt with head on and immediately. But at the time, like I said earlier on in the introduction, other people within the sector were being furloughed or they were being um, hit with the challenges, the individual personal challenges of having to deal with school closures and um, working from home and, um, and dealing with uh, illnesses and the pandemic itself. For Tony, he detailed how he saw the COVID-19 COVID as a criminal opportunity. And a lot of this lecture is structured around the idea of COVID-19 as a criminal opportunity um, based on these conversations. That those who want to prevent crime, like we fight fraud, he said needed to work quickly to create an awareness of the vulnerabilities lockdown posed towards institutions, organisations, corporations and the individual and how these might be managed to reduce loss and harm. Josie raised concerns about the impact of prison lockdowns on the families of prisoners, often the forgotten victims of crime, children, partners, parents and siblings of prisoners were suddenly unable to establish any regular contact with their loved ones in prison. Concerned about their welfare and inability to escape close contact with staff and new prisoners who could potentially bring the virus into prison undetected. Both Tony and Jodie adapted to the lockdown quickly. They demonstrated innovation with two very distinct projects responding to the impact of the pandemic. We Fight Fraud created an eight hour live webinar detailing the criminal opportunity of COVID-19 from the perspective of ex-criminals, ethical hackers and fraud and financial crime experts. Whereas, one, um, whereas our empty chair ran a social media campaign that merged into a support network for the partners and um, family of people in prison to highlight the plight of prisoners' families who were struggling to maintain their relationships with their loved ones during, prison, during this time. So 
first, the first case study that I want to look at is to look at the criminal opportunity in terms of fraud and financial crime and to look at the case study of uh, We Fight Fraud. Just to give you a little bit of scope from, from an academic point of view and look at the facts and figures, Action Fraud detailed that over £11 million had been lost to COVID-19 scams between the 16th of March when lockdown began and the 8th of June, that there'd been 2,866 victims of COVID-specific related scams. More recently, there's been um, arrests and convictions for offering fake government refunds um, where one perpetrator sent thousands of texts detailed on the slide um, claiming to be from the authorities offering refunds to people as part of the government's response to the pandemic. Not only did he obtain um, finances from individuals, but he obtained 191 sets of personal details, of which 49 were then used for fraud. This one individual's total loss to his victims was over £10,000 simply from these texts alone. I'm going to hand over now to um, Tony Sales from We Fight Fraud and to Adam Boom, and I'm going to ask them to tell you about the criminal opportunity of COVID, but also what We Fight Fraud, their organisation, did um, to try and mitigate some of these um, threats. Thanks, Nick. Um, so, I mean, basically for us, we look at risk uh, across the board for uh, lots of corporate companies, and we we're always looking at what the latest risks are. We we saw the opportunity uh, coming because of, you know, the amount of people that would be working from home during lockdown, um, the amount of buildings that then would be left empty around town, uh, and also the amount of information that people would then leak out onto the, in onto the internet because they're not really aware of what it is that they're doing, you know, like what, how people most people don't understand how their data spirals out um, and and hackers grab it and stuff yeah so we was able to spot that opportunity very early on and just go uh, moving into it uh, very quickly so um i'll uh, i'll just go back a little bit um on uh, on the actual events of march and um talk about just briefly on how we got to that point where we were able to see what was coming up and, and put this event on. Because um, really the beginning of, of We Fight Fraud uh, was quite a few years earlier. Um, so Tony um, had come out of prison and decided that um, he was taking a new path and, um, and had started working in fraud prevention. Meanwhile, I was working in television. And um, my favorite subject, the most interesting subject, I always found to be crime. Why do people do, uh, why do people commit crime? You know, what, what do we as a society see as, as uh, right and wrong? Um, but I noticed just when you actually make programs about crime, the most interesting people to talk to are criminals or former criminals, but uh, television very rarely speaks to those people. So um, uh, television has a, a particular way in which it likes to present crime. Um, you know, the, crime is one of the absolute uh, pillars of, of TV. It's the most popular genre of fiction. And yet most of the programming is made by people who have never committed a crime and um, most of it follows a certain pattern um, and uh, you need to see people doing bad things and then receiving justice at the end of it. So in as far as helping us to understand why crime happens and uh, the causes of, of crime and what it really is, that's actually not very helpful. Um, but I uh, saw a documentary that Vice made about this guy called Tony Sales, who was um, uh, who was who had been a fraudster and uh, was helping to to uh, stop fraud and it was so different to anything else that i'd seen um that i 
just uh, had to get in touch with him. It was just a glimpse into a world that I had no idea about and I'd never seen reflected in the media. Um, so we, um, we got in touch and we realised quite quickly that there was a real um, opportunity to create a production company to make TV around this subject of crime, which was, which was giving a voice, uh, as Nicola would say, to people with lived experience of crime um, and get a very different perspective and portray crime in a very different way. It turns out that's actually quite an uphill battle um, when you're talking to commissioning editors who are wanting to commission programmes for people that have quite fixed ideas about what they want to watch. Getting people to watch and engage with something that they don't already know about is very difficult. We did have some, experience, some uh, successes. Uh, we made a programme um, about uh, a guy who wanted to apologise to the policeman that he shot 10 years earlier. Um, we produced that and we found a director, his cousin directed it, who's also an ex-offender. Um, and then we made a series for Channel 4 called What Makes a Murderer, where we took three people who had committed murder from the very um, from, from birth to that day when they were when they committed murder. We worked with um, with scientists, psychologists. We worked with neurocriminologists, and most importantly, we worked with the uh, the, the ex offenders themselves. So they were really performing a detective story on their own crime. Um, and we learned an enormous amount. I mean, just a huge amount. Uh, we're still working with all three of those um, of those people that had committed murder. And um, uh, but it was a real revelation, I, I would say. And, and certainly for me, and I know Tony said this, it changed our perception of why people commit crime and the backgrounds. So um, flash forwards three months from the end of us uh, finishing that series and that being broadcast and suddenly COVID hits and television basically just stopped. Um, it was like somebody turned the off button on um, on commissions because nobody could go out and film anything. So all our projects that we had uh, in the pipeline uh, just stopped. Um, and meanwhile, Tony said, there is going to be a massive crime wave because you've got all these people sitting at home uh, with no, a lot of them with no way of, uh, of, of getting income. A lot of people sort of on the fringes of crime are in insecure uh, jobs. Um, so, um, and also you've got a whole load of people at home suddenly not really having the same uh, security, cyber security controls that they would have uh, in the office. So we, um, we found ourselves wondering what to do with all this information. We couldn't get anyone in TV interested in it, but we had been thinking uh, previously about doing some sort of conference event. So we thought, well, we're, we're, um, we're media people, let's put on a conference event. And um, so we, we set about doing that and um, we realised that we had to do it very quickly um, and really actually with very little experience, we just threw ourselves into it. Um, it was <laughs> quite a challenging experience. Um, and, uh, so from six weeks from just having that idea to putting on this eight, eight hour event, we, um, uh, we, we, we managed to do it and it was a big success. Um, and in fact, we're doing, uh, the second, we're doing it again this year. So, um, it can't have been that bad, <laughs> but it was very, very hard work. It was one of, I, I have to say, having been through a lot of stressful TV productions, um, that was uh, probably uh, more stressful than any of them. Um, but it was hugely worthwhile. And the feedback that we had from it was um, was incredible. Yeah, so, we made some big predictions as well, didn't we? We made some, um, you know, we made some pretty huge predictions at the start of, you know, the show when we said that um, <clears throat> we would we we would see that bounce back loans would be one of the biggest frauds uh, that we've ever seen in history. Um, we said that fraud would rise by 70% when in, when everyone else was saying 25%, yeah? But it was just so obvious to us. And of course, mm. now, a year on, we are 
spot on with the the predictions um and kind of everyone's looking at us again saying wow like you predicted all that stuff uh but for us like adam so rightly said that lived experience gives us the the insight or the foresight i don't know which it is to be able to see that coming in you know in the future it's really easy for us to see and and covid crime i've been saying it for a while will continue for decades yeah so in years to come the amount of children that have been stuck in homes and have been abused and all of that stuff that's come right so going through what makes a murderer allowed me to understand what made me commit crimes it, probably i'd never looked at it like that before um and it was extremely emotional, but to be able to talk about it and then bring it out, that helps others. And then we get a world where perhaps we can actually impact on crime. And uh, no, that, that, that's what we're all about. So It's been interesting, hasn't it, that um, we've actually found since We Fight Fraud Live that a lot of our content, um, which we were struggling to get onto TV, we've made since for corporates because um there's a real there's a real incentive for them to engage with our content is that in in providing people help in understanding the causes of crime you can cut crime down tv's not really interested in that but um people with businesses are so um so that's been uh, it, it's been a, a actually a, a great a, an amazing journey and, and kind of a circular one where the ends have joined together so um an interesting position to be in now yeah agreed Nicola, thank you so uh, thank my... you so much um adam and tony for for telling us about how you put together and um, we fight fraud live um part of my ethnographic research was to um to observe we fight fraud live um, and it gave me a real insight, not only into um, into kind of the predictions that you've made, but also the way in which you structured it. And, and we've obviously had conversations about this since. Um, but there was there was a lot of buy in from official sources of knowledge um, and legitimate sources of knowledge. You had um, the, um, Karen Baxter, who was the I think the commander of um, City of London Police at the time. Um, who was one of the keynote speakers. And what that did was it was really the first time that I'd seen anyway, um, official sources of, of knowledge and powerful sources of knowledge around economic crime and financial crime um, actually legitimate lived experience. Um, I'll talk a little bit more about that at the end because actually this is where um, what Adam and Tony have done and what Jody do kind of comes together so I, I won't go into that too much now um, but thank you very much for sharing that and I'm going to move on to to um, look at prison as um, a distinct criminal opportunity as well. Um, for the kind of criminal opportunity moving on to prison um, really uh, and I'm, I'm just as disclaimer really I'm a very critical criminologist and um, Per, my personal opinion is that actually the way in which kind of COVID has been dealt with within prisons could be constructed as criminal, and I'll leave that there. Um, currently, there are 77,942 prisoners in England and Wales um, in the week, ending the 11th of January. Just in that one week, 498 prisoners tested positive with 4,800 um, testing positive since the start of the pandemic, of which testing in prisons didn't happen as early as testing in the community happened. One of the responses to the COVID um, crisis with prisoners was um, there was a pledge by the government to release 4,000 prisoners um, who didn't they feel or met the requirements of not really needing to be in prison and actually it would have eased some of the um, pressure upon um, the NHS staff that go into prisons to give care to, to prisoners um, and to kind of alleviate some of the risks. Uh, they pledged to release 4,000 prisoners, but only 316 prisoners were actually released before the scheme closed in August of 2020. 71 prisoners have died due to COVID-19 in prison. Um, 
and the figures for that are rising at a really worrying rate with 24 of those deaths happening in December 2020 alone. There's no figures for January yet because we are uh, only a few weeks in. An additional issue around kind of COVID in the criminal justice system is not just the impact on the on the prison service itself, but there is 54,000 unheard cases um, currently queuing within the magistrates and the Crown Court system that they estimate it will take some, some cases until 2021 to be heard. 15% of the prison population that I've just described are actually on remand and um, awaiting trial, so have yet to have their guilt determined. That's obviously a significant worry for, for access to justice in terms of the times um, that someone would be waiting to um, to have their trial, but also um, essentially there's 15% um, of the prison population that have yet to have, to have their um, kind of day in court, if you like. But yet they're in the, um, the conditions uh, described above around the COVID pandemic. Significantly, though, for what I'm going to, Jody is going to talk about is that because there are no official statistics around how many um, children actually have a parent in prison, um, these are not collected anywhere really. There's an estimate of between 310,000 and 500,000 children in England and Wales that have a parent in prison. So the impact of prisoners um, during the pandemic is not just on the prisoners themselves, not just on the um, the prison staff that work in prisons and the NHS staff that go, NHS staff that go in to support um, unwell prisoners in prison, and um, but also on the families and children of um, of the prisoners themselves. With that, I would really like to hand over to Jody from our empty chair who we'll discuss a little bit about um, why COVID in prisons is significant to um, the uh, people who have relationships with people in prison and um, and beyond. So thank you, Jodie. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Jodie. I'm from I'm from our empty chair. Um, so I'll just get straight into it. Um, Nicola very nicely set the scene with a lot of those really stark st statistics about um, the impact COVID-19 is having on the prison estate. And just to kind of illuminate that for you further and um, to kind of set the scene a little bit. Um, so when we all experienced our first lockdown, that kind of that lockdown was um, kind of put in place in prisons um, through regime change. So what that has meant in practice is that Many people in prison are locked behind their cell doors for upwards of 23 hours a day. Um, and this is taken into account that people in prison are at an increased risk of testing positive for coronavirus and from dying from coronavirus. Um, just because of the impossibility of kind of adhering to government guidelines in that space. Um, it's impossible to socially distance in a prison setting. You're often sharing cells with another person. Your toilet is often located in your cell. Access to basic sanitation and hygiene facilities is severely limited. Um, and we kind of saw at the very beginning of lockdown that there was a huge pile of medical evidence being reported in the Lancet. There was Public Health England even saying, basically, we need to reduce the prison population and we need to reduce it by around 10,000 to 15,000 people in order to kind of nip this in the bud before um, prisons become incubators for the virus and it spreads and it, we lose lives and it puts pressure on existing restricted health services within prison but also in the community um make it essentially making the same arguments that the government has been making around protecting the nhs and saving lives um this was the exact same case for prisons but actually that increased risk um of of people in prison contracting coronavirus and and it's spreading and lives being lost was never acknowledged so we know that from again lots and lots of medical evidence from most recently the Nuffield Health published a study which showed that um, 
people in prison have poorer health outcomes. And actually, if if there was a situation where a person in prison was so ill that they needed to attend hospital, chronic staff shortages actually mean that that's not able to take place in a safe way or may not take place at all. And again, lives are lost. Um, so I'm setting the scene there in what, what, what kind of coronavirus has meant practically for prison. But what I really want to focus on is a very key change that was made when lockdown um, started at the end of March 2020 is that physical prison visits were suspended. So nobody can go could go and visit their loved one in prison. Um, and that's what kind of um, pushed me and um, and the, my co-founder of Our Empty Chair to kind of set up um, the group is that a lot of established charities and people working in prison reform were rightfully focused on the loss of life, the health implications, um, focusing on early release, which are all rightful causes. Um, but a lot of these campaigns were not taking into account the impact on relationships, particularly concerning families and children. Um, and there's been a lot of talk about lived experience already. And sort of my lived experience was activated in this way because I've grown up experiencing parental imprisonment and around um, and just before the pandemic started I was in the middle of supporting my father with legal issues so I feel like um, they my kind of lived experience intensified around this time because there was a real risk um, there was a real risk that my father would be imprisoned again um, so I, I guess that lived experience combined with a real need um, and desire to bring together the voices of families that were mobilizing during this time. And a little bit on, on that kind of mobilization side is that because having a loved one in prison is such a shamed and stigmatized experience, you often don't hear the stories or experiences of um, of people who have a loved one in prison. It's not something that you hear publicly. It's not something you're going to discuss with your mates at the pub. Like you just don't hear about it. Um, at, but also that's not to say that families who have a loved one in prison don't mobilize. Historically, you see that prisoner families will mobilize in private spaces, like private Facebook groups that, that, um, that are formed around prisoners' wives and kind of helping each other get to visits and, um, developing community spaces kind of behind closed doors um, where it feels more protected. But what we saw when the pandemic started and in-person prison visits were suspended is that um, prisoners' families started to articulate their concerns, their fears, their worries in a very public way. They were directly calling out the Secretary of State. The they were directly calling out prison reform charities that they felt weren't working adequately to make their concerns heard. And they were showing a real push for wanting to hold people accountable. Um, and what I kind of felt was that there was no kind of concentrated effort to bring these voices together. And that's that's kind of how our empty chair started. Um, and we took a lot of we took a lot of inspiration from um, campaigns around repeal the eighth in Ireland. Um, there's a really popular campaign called In Her Shoes, where during the fight to decriminalize abortion, um, there was a campaign which took pictures of the shoes that women were wearing and posted those pictures alongside their experiences of having to travel to the UK or elsewhere for an abortion because they couldn't access one legally in their own country. And I think that aesthetic point is um, is really key here because what we tried to do with attaching the picture of the chair that is that has been left empty by a loved one being imprisoned is that we're trying to really draw out the importance of those relationships and maintaining those relationships during a pandemic and, and the very practical and emotional consequences of not being able to um, to see your loved one during a really, really traumatic time. Um, so let me just read my notes. <laughs> so in, in very practical sense, the suspension of like physical visits was really, re was really destabilizing for families. So particularly for families who were parents, 
um, you often hear the phrase um, parenting from prison and you kind of build a routine around having a loved one in prison. And that could be sort of, well, we know we're going to visit dad on a Saturday afternoon. That's our weekend. We need this amount of time to get there. And you kind of, you build, you have to build your life around that. Um, and also it can be little things like, I know dad's going to call me on Wednesday evening and like, this is how we're going to share out the, the phone because he only gets 10 minutes when he calls. And in relation to children, there's kind of an extra layer of trauma there in that children were experiencing many destabilizing things during this time as well. For example, schools closing and moving to homeschool, parents being furloughed or parents being key workers and, and kind of that dynamic, but also as was alluded to um, during the when when the We Fight Fraud team were talking, um, people being in really abusive situations and actually the the situation in prisons compounding the existing issues that are happening in the community, um, and just carrying on from that with children, um, as Nicola explained before um, when the stats were on this were on the screen. The, there's an estimated 310,000 to, to 500,000 children who have a parent in prison. However, the state don't collect figures on this. So in a the, the, the kind of numbers of children who have a parent in prison isn't collected by a statutory body. And what this means in practice is that the support needs just aren't identified. Um, and, and effectively, that means that this is a hidden group who are really vulnerable and need support. And that's just not identified in a, in a kind of concrete way. Um, and so what you've had during this time is not only kind of grassroots collectives like our empty chair that kind of perform a support, supportive and mutual aid function, which I'll, I'll get onto a little bit later, but you've also got small specialist charities that in a way are having to perform the job of the state by telephoning schools and saying, do you have, um, do you have any, children at your school have a parent in prison because we're a provider of support and um and in a lot of cases that's just not identified um and just talking again about the practical implications of physical visits not taking place um many of the families that we spoke to um particularly families with small children there were real really severe consequences for that physical contact being lost. Um, for example, um, we were in contact with one mum whose husband was in prison and her youngest her youngest child was under one years old. And um, as a result of prison visits being suspended, um, dad actually missed out on, on um, the baby's first steps. Um, and there are also genuine fears that once the parent was released from prison, what would it look like in trying to establish that bond again? Um, and for a lot of families, there were genuine con concerns that actually, like, how are my children going to feel when that when dad returns home? And there's just no relationship there. And it just feels like there's a stranger in the house. Um, and when we look at the state's response to, for example, um, children who um whose parents are separated and what and what kind of contact arrangements look like under the pandemic we can see that there's there's a real kind of push to kind of think of really concrete and effective solutions like government guidance on that subject on the subject of um children who have separated parents and and how they make sure that they're kind of in contact with with kind of both sides is there's a real emphasis on using technology and kind of video calls etc which is something that the prison estate has started to roll out um but as nicola kind of alluded to and i'm, I'm totally with <laughs> the critical um side of this is that the state th there's a lot of state violence at play in how the state have responded to prisons, prisoners and prisoners' families throughout the pandemic. Um, in relation to video visits, the state approach to this is shrouded in kind of a politics of punishment, securitization and surveillance. Um, 
the virtual visiting technology, which is available for people with a loved one in prison now, you have situations where you're kicked off of the technology if there's too much movement in the background, as this is classed as a security concern. And it kind of begs the question of what does this mean for young children who um, find it really difficult to engage with virtual means of contact anyway. Um, and you get one 30 minute slot a month compared to pre-pandemic times where you'd at least have a one hour visit, a, a, um, you'd at least have a one hour visit available each week, if not two. Um, and that would be optional for everybody. Um, when when we saw last year when when the pandemic um looked like it was kind of fading away and lockdown restrictions began to ease we saw that there were changes to prison practice um when visits looked like they were starting again but they were exclusionary to children under 10 years old and then we also spoke to families who were legitimately um well illegitimately kind of banned from visiting because they, they tried to go for a physical visit with the child and the child reached over and tried to um, touch her dad's arm and that was deemed a breach of security so they were banned from visiting. So there's a lot of kind of state violence at play here in the way that families, families are monitored and have to adhere to restrictions around security and risk when actually they aren't part of this institution. Um, and they aren't institutionalized in, a, in, in, a, in the sense that their loved one is, however rightly or wrongly that is. Um, and so in legal terms, there's a whole list of kind of human rights legislation, international human rights legislation that I could reel off and tell you, and I can run through them very quickly. Um, Article 8 of the ECHR, Article 2 and 3, and Article 9 of the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child. The 2004 Children Act states that prison governors fall within the list of authorities required to safeguard children. There's statutory instruments which, which say that prisons need to pay special attention to maintaining relationships. There's policies, there's prison service instructions, there's MOJ policy guidance, there's case law all which point to the fact that this is a grave injustice, that families being separated from their loved ones during the pandemic, although it's a legitimate aim to curb the spread of coronavirus, um, when this is coupled with a real lack of effort to reduce the prison population, to reduce overcrowding, to enable people who are no risk to the community to isolate in the to isolate in the community with their families, where they can get the support they need, and be a low, be a decreased risk of contracting coronavirus. There is no excuse for this to continue. There's no excuse for the technology that has been shoddily put in place. Um, to to remain how it is the capacity hasn't been expanded and there's no excuse for there not to have been a concrete roadmap for when prison visits will start again because actually the well-being and um the well-being and health and safety of both prisoners and their families and their children depends on being able to maintain those relationships. And this is away from any drive to reduce reoffending. It's a genuine human right that those relationships are able to be maintained. Um, and what I want to come back to is that this, this is all about relationships. This is about building a system of justice that, that rests on love and care. And, and, and this is what our empty chair is about. Um, as you can see from the slide that's on at the moment, when we were putting together the testimonies from families, we didn't focus on particular offences, we didn't focus on risk. This was a real opportunity to, to truly be inclusive and include a broad range of experiences. Um, and it kind of crucially started as a response to um, a response to calls for the release of people in prison. As I said at the start of, of um, as I said when I started talking, Public Health England, The Lancet, lots of public health professionals recommended at least a 10% reduction of the prison population. The Ministry of Justice set out to release people from prison early, pledging that they release 4,000 people. 
but they created a scheme that was so unworkable nobody in prison would have met those guidelines um so it was a completely bureaucratic and unworkable system um that was really set up to fail um and just to wrap up with some concrete things that our empty chair have done um other than just being a space to platform the voices of families who are separated um, by prison, is we're currently in the middle of a legal action against the Ministry of Justice for preventing meaningful contact between children and their parent in prison. Um, And that's just a testament really to actually bringing together those voices because once there's a collective voice, you're able to have such a, 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 a much bigger impact. And that meant that we were approached by barristers and QCs, et cetera, that were really interested in taking this forward. So we are taking that forward at the moment with a number of families that um, that have have a loved one, have a parent in prison. Um, and also it is it has evolved into sort of a mutual aid um, project with families that we've built relationships with, feeling really encouraged by... Um, by raising their voice on this issue and have taken it upon themselves to kind of engage with their local politicians. Um, So we do things around like checking letters, like really small actions that really mean a lot when people are isolated. Um, So yeah, I'll leave it there. (laughs) I feel like I've rambled on, but yeah, thank you very much. Thank you so much for that, Josie. I really, really appreciate that and your insight. Um, I think that kind of just a few words about our empty chair part of my ethnographic research was to kind of collect and collate the tweets um and since then Jodie and I have have looked at analyzing them together because obviously from a, a kind of sociologist criminologist point of view I'm interested in in how this campaign was done and, and what it actually means especially because it's it's come off the back of lived experience so in actually one of the kind of key things about it and actually grabbing our attention is um, is that actually the prisoners' families are having to do a certain amount of work to get to you to listen to them. And our empty chair is facilitating that work. That work is to get you guys, people who've never met anyone in prison that you know of or don't have any relatives in prison, is to get people who have no experience of prison, of who prisoners' families are to identify with prisoners' families, to realise that it could happen to anyone, to realise that actually when you look at the photographs of the empty chair, that that could easily be a chair in your living room where your loved one is not there, that the um, stigma around who prisoners' families are, actually prisoners' families are you, you know, and that's, that's the work that our empty chair was doing in order to have the messages of prisoners families and the impact of how the um having a prisoner uh, a relative or um, partner parent in prison during the pandemic has felt they've had to get you to identify with them first and that is the work of um, of the campaign of our empty chair so kind of to wrap up i guess towards the the studies and why these two case studies um what both We Fight Fraud and Our Empty Chair did is they mobilised lived experience. In both case studies, they brought things that now on reflection, when we look back kind of 10 months later, we can look back and say, wow, like, surely we all realised it was going to be like this. Surely we realised it was going to hit prisoners and their families hard. Surely we realised that there was going to be such a great increase in fraud and financial crime. Of course it was, it was always going to happen, but hindsight's 2020. What our empty chair did and what We Fight Fraud did was they brought that knowledge to you at a point where nobody was talking about it. Nobody was considering because everyone else was distracted. Rightly so, having to deal with their own personal circumstances, having to make dramatic changes. Even us as researchers in academia were having to switch from face-to-face learning to online learning. Um, We were having to make massive bureaucratic changes. We were distracted with our own priorities. And what these two um, case studies show was how when lived experience adapts, it adapts quickly. Um, 
and perhaps that is because and this is some of the kind of exploration that we're still doing is perhaps because once you have lived experience of crime deviance and social control actually one of the things that you learn is how to adapt to a crisis because quite often when you have that lived experience you have had to adapt to crisis after crisis after crisis and you've had to innovate you've had to find ways to cope and to thrive within that crisis space therefore when everyone else is having to adapt at the speed that they can adapt people with lived experience within the areas of criminal justice and within the areas of security were able to just adapt that much quicker and bring this expertise that's been developed out of lived experience to campaign on behalf of prisons prisoners families to highlight the issues with fraud and economic crime was able to be done importantly very very quickly but that's not to say that everyone accepts that knowledge when it's presented to you so there is a barrier to having that knowledge heard lived experience and the knowledge that comes from lived experience still has um, a barrier in that it is still a form of subjugated knowledge what our empty chair shows is aesthetically some of the work that has to go in to be listened to. We need you to identify with a prisoner's family, realise that they're not some kind of distant other, that they could be one of us, and then maybe we'll care about them. Maybe we'll care to listen to their message. But once you listen to that message, even when you're heard, in order for it to be mobilised, further work needs to be done to prove then that the lived experience actor and the knowledge that they have to offer that you finally listen to is legitimate. This is because the stigma that we attach to people with lived experience of crime, deviance and social control, whether they be someone who's got a um, criminal record or whether they be the families um, and partners, children of those who are in prison, that stigma has to be overcome first. Firstly, aesthetically in order to be listened to but then we have to mobilize other forms of power such as partnering with the police such as partnering with with universities and other legitimate organizations to say that actually this knowledge is legitimate so therefore people with lived experience not only have to overcome the aesthetic barrier to be listened to first and foremost but they have to carry on doing that work to prove that they're legitimate to prove that their expertise that they have to offer is that is worthy of mobilization and that's what our empty chair and we fight fraud have both done that's a process um, of undoing stigma and mobilizing lived experience um, that is kind of always having to be done it's work that doesn't end when you have lived experience and you're trying to um, communicate those messages and you're trying to mobilize them in ways that can make the world better you have to keep doing that work it doesn't really ever end it's not like you can get a PhD and suddenly be listened to in it in its own right you still have to keep doing that work so moving forward then how we're keeping doing that work our empty chair and we fight fraud our research partners of mine that i work with in lancaster university in the law school we are now research partners they are not simply um co-producers of knowledge for the sake of user voice we are doing meaningful work together moving forward part of that work is back and hard in forthcoming we've got a paper called the aesthetic labor of undoing stigma that starts to unpick the work that people with lived experience, particularly prisoners' families, have to do in order to be heard. They have to undo this stigma in, in a way that is visible, particularly in the visual world that we live in now, particularly as we deal with things over, um, over kind of social media and things like that. It has to be visible. And this labour has to be done. It's we argue that it's a form of emotional labour that is specific to those with lived experience and that actually it's a subjugated area of knowledge that um that hasn't really been fully explored by sociologists and criminologists yet so we're doing it so the second thing moving forward is um our partnership with we fight fraud we've just received an esrc iaa which is um, an impact acceleration award 
and it's a funded collaboration between Lancaster University Law School and We Fight Fraud, where we will be doing not only a research project together, um, but also a crime prevention initiative um, or intervention called a Rapid Response to Fraud and Eco Economic Crime. The organisation of this rapid response is based upon um, academic literature, but what this um, organisation does is it brings together and legitimates lived experience. The ability of lived experience to move quickly, the rapid response will be a 14 day process where organisations will present a case to We Fight Fraud and to the university and in collaboration with Lancashire Constabulary we will work together within 14 days to problem solve that case and to present a re present a report back to the this, this stakeholder group. This will tell them how we've identified the issue, how we've understood it through academic research, through lived experience, through learned experience with the partners within We Fight Fraud um, that have worked within um, investigative, within police forces, as well as ex-frauds, as ethical hackers. We will all come together and bring that knowledge quickly within this 14 days. We'll create a report that tells companies, organisations, third sector organisations how to manage that threat. So crucially, they will go from presenting a threat to us to learning how to manage and mitigate that threat within 14 days. This intervention is steeped and and built on the back of lived experience expertise and it's potentially a really innovative way of um of mobilizing lived experience to create um, and to respond to a problem that is probably one of the biggest problems in um, criminal justice and security at this time um, all that's kind of really left to say, I think, is um, do you have any questions? Thank you very much for listening. Thank you to um, my research partners, um, Tony Sales, Adam Boom and Josie Beck. Um, I really look forward to moving forward with our research projects and various different things that we do in the future. Um, and we'd love to answer any questions that you might have. Thank you very much indeed. Um, and thank you to all for what was really such an incredibly thought-provoking, but also insightful, moving and sobering presentation. But my special thanks to Tony, to Adam and to Jodie, specifically for sharing not only their ongoing work, but also about being so open about their own experiences. And that has an authenticity and a ring to it that I think is so incredibly important and why the research is so powerful. Thank you.